Okay. Am I audible in the back of this room? Yes? So no need for a microphone? Cool. Okay, I'm Klaas and this is what I look like. In case you wonder, this is my natural habitat nowadays. I have a hobby in glider piloting. I used to have hobbies in computing. Um, I've been contributing to various Linux projects. I've been organizing quite a bit of conferences on Linux and open source. And then glider piloting came along and I dropped everything and I only was learning how to fly. Until. January 5th, a quarter to six in the morning, I woke up. And I had no clue why. Well, I actually did have a clue because I heard something. But somebody broke into my house that day. And he did that, we know now, through a Dutch technique called flipperen, which has two word meanings in Dutch alone. One is this, playing pinball. That's not what I'm talking about. But they broke in my, to my house using a credit card, putting it in the lock and toying with it until the lock of latch opens and you can walk into the door. Excuse me? Not on my door. So I can't put any protection against that into my door. I could have done one other thing, actually lock the door. That would have helped a lot. <laughs> Which I learned the hard way, that way. So, um, I had at least one guy coming in, looking around, seeing a nice laptop, seeing a Wii U gamepad. So apparently this is not the guy who plays games, because a Wii U has a gamepad, so tablet with controls etc. And it actually has a console where you put CDs in. They only took the gamepad, probably because it looked like something expensive. So now I'm stuck with just the other half and you can't buy them separate. But, um, so, a guy made one tiny detail mistake. He, so, my house was being redecorated at that point and in the hallway there were some planks and one of the planks tripped, probably because he ran too, past it too fast. So that plank fell down, that woke me up, and um, you might not know what I look like at night, but it probably went something like, oh, I walked down, put the plank right up, noticed the front door was open, closed the front door, walked up back to my room, fell asleep. Woke up at 9, got a cup of tea, went back to sleep, woke up at 11, took my, uh, for, probably took a book, started reading, etc. And at 3 p.m., I decided I wanted to have something to eat, so I had to go to the local supermarket. Remember, it was January, so I took my winter coat. No, I didn't take my winter coat, because the location where my winter coat should have been, which is on a chair on the dining table, was empty. I went to the uh, Kapstok. Anyway, wardrobe where you put your, your coats. And indeed, my summer jacket was there, my uh, autumn jacket was there, and my winter coat was missing. I went upstairs to see if I undid it in the bathroom or something like that. No winter jacket. Slowly starting to suspect something, I went to the neighbor. Can you please help me find my winter jacket because I think I'm going bonkers. Uh, my neighbor actually had to tell me, Klaus, you probably were robbed last night. Do you miss anything else? Um, yes, my laptop bag. Uh, so my ski jacket. Oh, my phone is missing. Oh, how am I going to call the police? Then I realized that I still had the landline. So um, called the police, they came actually figured out that there was no other sign of a break-in, so they had to use that flipper te technique to get in. And that's it. 
dear Mr. Van Gant, we'll be in contact to take the final notes. So they actually came, looked around, noticed that they couldn't find any traces of a burglary, except that things were missing and that I knew that I had closed the door uh, early in the morning. And they left. Oh, they did ask whether I wanted to have some professional help to get myself over the emotional shock. <laughs> nah, I will handle with that. Tip, do it. I haven't slept for the exactly week after. Just trying to go to, s f being afraid to go to sleep, only fall asleep at two, wake up at four, wake up at six, wake up at eight and be late for work. <laughs> so I hadn't expected it, but it did take quite a bit of toll on me. It's not something you do easily. You, you really get affected by having somebody walk in and taking away stuff. And I'm not really attached to my laptop. I'm a little bit attached to the data that was on it and I did back, that, did back it up a week earlier. I was attached to my phone, a little bit. So, I was angry, I was afraid and I was annoyed. So I wanted to start fighting back. Of course, I did get a visit from the local police again. Dear Mr. Van Gant, let's talk about how we can prevent the next. Okay, yes, one thing I figured out, I will actually lock my door the next time. So flip, because if I had turned the latch two times, a few other things would have come out in the door, put in the frame and the door wouldn't have moved. So lazy me paid the hard learning fee to learn that. Other than that, make sure nothing is visible. So don't leave your laptop hanging, lying around in the living room, blinking lights, etc. So it actually is good, well visible during the night. Make sure it's gone, make sure you do that they, don't, they won't find it. And of course, um, make sure of, uh, burglars don't want to get to you. So for example, light things up, make it hard for them to actually look inside to see if there's anything of value there, put up signs, the neighbors are watching over me and I actually have a pretty nasty neighbor with a black belt in karate and judo. Dear burglars, pay attention if you watch this video stream. Um, and he actually, at some point, he told me later, had a guy robbing his car, he jumped on him, held him until the police arrived in the car, the police said, okay, mister, you can let him go. We have him now. They had him, he ran out of his jacket and was gone. <laughs> <laughs> so the next burglar my neighbor sees is really going to have it. <laughs> but he wasn't home that night. <laughs> um, one other tip they gave me, Mr. Van Gant, get curtains. So I'm following the Dutch tradition of I have nothing to hide, you can watch inside my house. They told me I do have something to hide because people can look from the street to see how expensive my laptop is. So nowadays I bring my laptop with me to bed. Yes, I know it sounds geeky, but at least that means that I either have to get into my bedroom to actually steal it, or they won't find it. Excuse me? No, it's not under my pillow. <laughs> and I, no, I don't sleep with my laptop either. <laughs> yes, it is in sleep mode. <laughs> but I was angry. And when geeks get angry, they want solutions. So I want an anti burglar system. God, them son of a beep, etc. So, you start, as a geek, you start looking around, you quickly realize that there are nice companies who install those kinds of things for you. So you pay them an amount, they install all kinds of stuff and it works. Nah, I can do better. So I went to some interesting website called Deal Extreme. I found a few cheap IP cameras that more or less did what I expected. I hoped, bought them hooked them up, and here they are. So they have Wi-Fi, they have fixed Ethernet, they have, uh, well, enough resolution to hopefully identify somebody on the picture. 
they have night vision, so you see all kinds of LEDs around it. They're cheap, good asset. And you can move them around. So if I am at the top floor of my bedroom and I see somebody at the ground floor walking around, I can actually follow them. Yes, it is easy with my laptop next to me, absolutely. Um, sounds like a very geeky toy, it is. So I bought two, had them ship over, and that went all smooth, installed them, and thought, hmm, that's only part of the solution. Now I actually have those things. So they come with software. Essentially, they come with the Linux machine inside, that has a web interface, so you can log into the website and then you see this. It's a video stream, quickly updated, it's a GIF animation, I believe. And buttons. So this is during daylight, and this is what it looks like during night. So infrared, so actually you see them light up kind of pinkish, a little bit. But you don't see the infrared light itself, but you do see, of course, in the camera that it has a nice beam sh uh, lighting up what it's, need, what it's rec recording. But if it is just a web interface, that means that if I don't wake up, I won't see them. And even if I see them, uh, well, good luck. So I need to record them. So I need recording software, do I? Okay, I am a good geek, so I will first check if there's an open source project that does what I need. I'll get back to that. No, I don't get back to that, sorry. Need to do something else first. So, if I want to record something, the cameras can send out a data stream. Um, it can be um, a real-time streaming protocol stream, it can be a just regular motion JPEG stream. Or it can be something Microsoft specific called ASF. Um, you can even get si single photos. Every time you request one, you get just a JPEG back. Well, sounds nice. But in uh, any case, it's motion JPEG, which means that every frame in itself will be a JPEG picture. Every next one is one, every next one is one. That's easy, nice coding. No need to worry about complex things like MPEG-2 or MPEG-4 and things like that, but it is 400 kilobyte per second. Well, any Wi-Fi connection can handle that, right? You have two, 800 kilobyte per second. That's quite a bit of packets per second. <laughs> so my Wi-Fi router, which has a very famous uh, US brand name on it with a bridge in the logo, um, can barely cope with it. So it can, yes it works, it will stream, but if I now take my laptop and actually try to review that stream, it is more or less getting out of its performance, which is weird because I'm way within specs. Okay, naughty guys. So at first I thought, okay, let's use video LAN. Um, actually got me some experience with how to get those data streams out. Um, looking on the internet, this is a no-name camera that exists with at least 10 different logos on it. So if you see a camera from the company called Skytronic, it's this one. If you see it with uh, Telin no, not Telindus, uh, Telos, it's this one. If you see it with X-Factor, it's this one. There's a lot of them. All the same thing, probably one factory just making a batch of it and somebody else putting a, putting a tag on it. Um, according to all the websites, you can put extra statements after it to specify a different resolution that should reduce the data stream, or put a different frame rate in there that should reduce the data stream. No, neither of them work. Apparently I have the El Cheapo, El Cheapo version that doesn't understand that. And the mechanism to update the internal software is documented. There is a, a mechanism in the UI to do so. And unfortunately, I don't have a brand logo on my box, so I don't know which website I have to go to to get the new firmware. So I have to 
do with the box I have, which doesn't have a resolution change, which doesn't have a frame rate change. So I am stuck with that 400 kilobyte a second. But I did find an open source project that will allow me to actually take those data streams in, look at them, see if something moves, and as soon as something starts moving, it will go in an al alarm state and actually write the streams to disk. Sounds nice, right? So on, this is a picture from their website, and they have um, five different devices hooked up. And they have also four different cameras hooked up directly to the PC. So they go to the video for Linux framework directly as a video stream inside the machine. I did have one of those cameras, a friend of mine came up with um, such a camera that is a CCTV camera and he had also a dongle to go from a composite video to USB, so I had that solution as well. So essentially I have three cameras, sounds perfect for me. I installed it on my Raspberry Pi and that took me a day. By the way, not a screenshot, looks nice. You can actually, it has a web interface, you can access the web interface from the outside, you can set passwords, you can have people that only can see certain streams and people that can see all the streams. It's really flexible, it's really nice, contains everything I ever wished for except the kitchen sink. Um, oh, and it had one other issue, tiny issue. It requires PHP, it requires Perl, it requires Python, it requires uh, a web server, it requires a database. OpenCV, uh, parts were written in C++. It took me a while to get, to get everything installed. It took me a while to find all the scripts that I needed to run to initialize a database. And mind you, I'm an embedded guy. Databases to me are something that are in big, big ser servers. So even understanding that the database has a command line is beyond my regular knowledge. I learned that the hard way. Um, but it worked. The load of the Raspberry Pi was three, which means that there are three processes running every time you look. There were a horrible amount of errors in the log, because every now and then they would lose connection to the camera because the Pi couldn't keep up. So it had to disco completely disconnect. Write everything back in the log, oops, I lost the camera, hook up again, start recording, and it would in a minute or so again lose the connection because it couldn't keep up. So, not good enough. Oh, and the web interface was slow. Give me that camera. Pling. And as soon as the pling came, um, I would have a real live streaming video, etc., that usually lagged about a minute behind. But again, it works. Then I became stupid. Don't do what I did. Never. Just don't. Look, I'm grey hairish. That's for a reason. I decided I could do better. And very Easily so. So, you already noticed that there was something called OpenCV in the previous slide about uh, ZoneMinder. OpenCV is a library for computer vision. It contains all kinds of interfaces and algorithms to take video streams, to take images and find things on them. You can use OpenCV to build face recognition, to build face identification. You can use OpenCV to recognize uh, signs when you, of road signs when you are driving. All that kind of things have been written in OpenCV. Nearly every company in the world uses OpenCV to do things like that. And so did I. I bought a book on OpenCV, I read a few websites, and slowly and slowly I started understanding how OpenCV works. So it's not that hard. Let me actually walk you through. I have a class video capture that I need an input video, so I need to specify a URL where I can get it, or I need to specify zero if I want slash dev slash video zero, or I just typed slash dev slash video zero, all works. I have a few uh, computer vision matrices that will contain my frames, 
and then I just rewrite something to frames and I start toying with the frames. So the setup is easy, right? Everybody agrees? Yay for OpenCV? Good. So let's take two images. I don't know who that guy is. Um, actually that shirt is red. Really, really red. So what happens here is that if it's not really, really light, the camera will still put the infrared uh, stuff on uh, beam out, which on my really red shirt doesn't register as red, because it's infrared, so it will not get all the light back, which is why the color changes. At least that's what I taught, my, taught myself. So I have two images that look relatively similar, except for this. So the first thing I do is I quickly realized that my cameras are horribly bad. Maybe I didn't tell you yet. Uh, cheap, Hong Kong, bad. So um, there's a lot of noise. Uh, a pixel tends to flutter in subsequent images around three, four numbers. So red varies between, if it's 220, red might vary between 225 and 215 or so. So it's really horrible, really snowy. So one thing to get away with that is actually, well, first of all, let's make it grayscale. Um, Anyone ever turned the color image into grayscale? How do you do that? <coughs> so, yes, except for taking the short way out and converting to grayscale. How do you do it if you want to code it by hand? Yeah, you have grades for every color, for R, T, and D. Yes. And the G is uh, the most, the heaviest, and then R, and then yeah. is only 10%. So indeed, you take a formula where you take the red, green, and blue components. Green is usually accounted for 70% of the grayscale value, red for 20%, and blue for 10%. Something like that. It's actually the, the official definition has four digits per color. But so apparently, going to grayscale is a science in itself. But we go to grayscale, which already helps averaging the numbers a little bit because now I have three pixel, three colors averaging into one and let's throw a Gaussian blur on it just to make sure that I also spread out the values of neighboring pixels a little bit. Do you do a temporal blur? A uh, what? Temporal blur, so you take a couple of consecutive frames. Oh, uh, so okay, if I would have taken a temporal blur and taken two images and added them up, I can't do the next step which is actually subtracting them from each other, which I want to do in order to find differences between frames because I want to see what changes. <laughs> um, I could have done that by the way, that's not a problem, but I would have been differentiating between this and the next versus two back and three back. And I was still planning to get it in my poor small Raspberry Pi, which doesn't have that much memory and I'm still working with quite big frames of 640 by 480 pixels. Then uh, one of my co-workers came with a brilliant idea, why are you using a Gaussian blur? Why not just take the big image and go back to 320 times 240? Because th in that case you also average between neighboring pixels or if you take a m somewhat in more complicated uh, averaging mechanism you get even more pixels across so you also reduce. And by, the m by magic you reduce the number of calculations you're going to do next by times four. Hey, that's an idea. Okay, for this example I stick to Gaussian blur. So in, I took a Gaussian blur of uh, a block of nine by nine pixels that I am moving across and actually, well, sort of smoothing out the image with. The next thing I do is actually take this image, take the previous image, subtract them from each other where every number will be its absolute. So if one pixel is lighter it, than the other one, it will be a positive number. If it's darker, it will also be a positive number. So you see a door, you see an idiot with a hand up and a head down, because one it was there and one hand it was there. 
We're slowly getting there. There's definitely motion here, right? So now we need to quantify how much motion there is. So there are kind of a few algorithms to do so. Uh, you could do edge detection. Um, the book I actually had said, okay, use the Kenny algorithm, which for once I didn't bother looking up what it did. Um, but it gets quite a nice picture. So now at least we know that there was apparently something more here. Is that relevant? Is that something important? I don't know yet. So in the end, I want to know if there is something really changing on that picture. So let's actually merge all those lines together to see how big the area is that is affected. Or whether it's multiple areas that are affected that have nothing to do with each other. So you have a dilate that will just blur everything together. And most documents say, okay, if you do a dilate, you also have to do a erode to get it smaller again. So it looks like we have three different areas in the picture that are affected. Well, let's just take that knowledge and draw it over the original image. So now we can tell why there's two things in here. So there's a shadow next to the thermometer that is probably affected by the fact that the door changed a little bit. So the lighting changed, the shadow got less or more, and that's what got this effect. And this is actually a reflection. Okay, nice to know, but the big, big box is something, somebody opening a door and waving his hand. So that's clearly, there's motion here. So, by now, I was one afternoon hacking away, toying with OpenCV and reading the book and paging it through. 25 lines of code and I was really happy with myself. Ha! I'm beating them. I can do it in 25 lines of code. But at this point, if a camera breaks down, my application sec folds. Uh, <laughs> I don't have a mechanism yet to handle two cameras, so I could of course run two processes in parallel. I work for a company that does multi-threading, so that's not an option. Um, and of course, I still need to write it down into files. So I probably need a few more lines of code to actually handle multiple cameras and let's immediately go for making it flexible so I can handle an unlimited amount of cameras and I will still hap happily do everything. And one camera can go away and the other two keep recording and things like that. So I want to do it really, really well. Stupid me. So. 25 lines grew into 2,500 lines of code. Forked across seven, eight classes, C++, remember, across two processes, because now I have a separate camera process that will take the image from the camera, keep the backend process updated with, hey, I have a new frame, hey, I have a new frame, hey, I have a new frame. And as soon as it stops sending, hey, I have a new frame, the backend process can actually just boot it, you know, kill minus nine and things like that. It dies and I can start up a new camera backend to get again and again and again. Of course, that adds to the amount of code you have, but it works. It's actually running right now and we could log in if the network was decent enough. At this point, of course, I have a very limited subset. So yes, I can have an unlimited amount of cameras that will write whenever something changes. So I have very nice images of a cat walking across the window. I have very nice images of somebody opening up a window, a neighbor, and the light reflection of the window going across my room. We're not there yet. By the way, if you want, uh, you can look at the code I wrote and tell me how bad a programmer I am. 
But this was my goal, right? Have it working on a Raspberry Pi, which I accidentally already had. I also have, well, some other toys to go with it, but for now let's just focus on the Raspberry Pi. There's an ARM 1176 in there, so that's uh, two generations old uh, ARM core, which has quite a bit of power. Actually, I had quite a few cell phones that have less power than this board. And if you have an El Cheapo Android phone, you may still have less power than this board has. But if you want to run my application on a Raspberry Pi, you're in no luck. It will not be able to do more than one frame a second on one camera. Okay, Mr. Performance Optimization Expert, why? <laughs> um, <laughs> So yes, I tend to do performance optimization for a living. And I had prototyped everything on my nice la new laptop. Shiny new laptop, 16 gigs of memory, latest Intel processor available. And it had only 10% of CPU power of one core used to get three cameras in. So what on earth went wrong that the Raspberry Pi can handle it? And that's not just because it's a 2 gigahertz versus a 700 megahertz processor. That's not it. Looking closer, I realized that OpenCV um, has very advanced optimizations for um, this type of Intel processors, where they're actually using SSE 3 and SSE 4 instructions to really take 8 or 16 pixels at a time do all the operations in one go, prefetch all the data if needed, and get it out again. So, 16 pixels at the go, everything nice, everybody happy. On an ARM 1176, they still go back to, uh, we don't know about an ARM 1176, but we do know about an ARM 720, so we will take pixel by pixel, we don't know anything about cache architectures, and let's take a pixel, do something with it, write it back, let's take the next pixel, write it back. <sighs> okay, so now I'm stuck with either writing all of this myself, and unfortunately this chip doesn't have any vector instructions, or I have to buy a new toy. New toy it is! <laughs> so far, would have anybody done something different? I had expected all of you to say, yes, we would have gone for the commercial solution. No? Okay, so we're still toying. Um, I actually already had this board at, uh, in the office because it has a quad-core Samsung processor. Anyone, any clue how big this actually is? It looks pretty heavy, right? <laughs> <laughs> You're doubling it. It's really this small. It's half the size of a credit card. But then it also fits in the phone, right? Well, essentially, this is Samsung Galaxy S3 hardware. So it's a small Korean company who makes these boards. Um, I'm not sure where they actually get the processors. Probably by talking to that other Korean company. They solder it together and they sell it for $90. So this is really cheap, and you get a cooling, fan f f uh, cooling fin for free. They even sell you, and I did fool myself and bought it, they sell you a fan that you can mount on the cooling block just to make it even cooler. Believe me, I have got that baby up to really high uh, loads, and it doesn't even give a blink. The cooling fan does of uh, the iron of the cooling block doesn't even get hot. And even worse, there's no way to screw the fan to the <laughs> block of metal. So that was a nice add-on sale. Thanks guys, I did get that fan and I have no way to actually hook the fan up to the co cooling block. But it works like a charm. So the standard, you, if you're smart, 
fortunately I was after having experienced this in the office. If you're smart, you buy it immediately with an SD card that you can fit in here, or you buy it with an eMMC, so an embedded MMC card, that is what is in your phone as well. So that's faster than an SD card, it, it has more or less the same structure, it's more or less addressed in the same way, and you buy it when you buy the board. Don't think of building your own, just buy it, make sure that the board works first. So I did. It comes with the stock Android, uh, of course a special hard kernel stock Android. How am I doing in time by the way? 24 minutes. Oh. Okay, so it comes with the stock Android and you start toying with it and then you say, okay, I want my own. Well, I'm personally, I try to use OpenSUSE wherever I can. I did find somewhere on the internet, I find an OpenSUSE image, I put it on, inserted it, and indeed it ran. Stupid me also bought a serial connector to hook up here. So I could actually see the kernels pulling out all kinds of data when booting. No sir, they optimized all of the serial port con communication out which indeed does speed up kernel booting by times four or so, but anyone wants to buy a USB serial converter? Yet another one? <laughs> <laughs> but it's a nice board, it can handle, handle all the load perfectly. So now I have uh, about 30% of a CPU that does all the backends and 10% of a CPU per camera. And everything works. So you didn't uh, optimize uh, using Neon? So OpenCV does have Neon optimizations. So Neon is an optional, remember that, optional block, IP block that you can buy on an ARM core, and fortunately Samsung did. So all the Samsung Exynos processors do have that Neon factor instruction set, and thus OpenCV will heavily use it, and that's why indeed I go from way overloaded on a Raspberry Pi to a machine that has double the CPU frequency and four times the number of cores and I go to a f fraction of one CPU that I'm only using thanks to all those factor instructions again. So yay to OpenCV and yay to me because I have a... hey, wake up! Because I have a working system So I was this far um, in April, except that I didn't buy that Samsung board back then. I was still running it first with the Raspberry Pi, that didn't work, then I took an old PC and hooked it up and that worked. And then that PC got overheated over a weekend, so I turned it off again and really realizing that I was going to buy that new Samsung board the next day. Maybe after my vacation. Oh shit, I'm back at work. I have so much to do. I'll buy it next week. Okay, I got burglarized again in mid-September. <coughs> so again, having police coming into your home saying, Mr. Vengan, that's not good. This time they, the burglars took a different route because they just bought a brick crowbar. They first tried the doors uh, to my garden, so I have nice opening garden doors. So they totally ruined them, but because there's all kinds of nice uh, finish on the doors. All broken, but the doors held. Then they saw, hey, that stupid Van Gent has one wooden window left in his house, which is in... Uh, well, the room after the kitchen. Let's put the crowbar in and they opened it up. To my surprise, they could do that fairly easily because I did have put, I did screw up that window. So I put big, this kind of screws in, four of them, only to realize after they have opened it up, the three of them didn't actually take the window but went secretly underneath. <laughs> 
So indeed, they did break the window, the crowbar did damage all of the wood, and that one left crew split up the window when they opened it up, so all the wood is totally damaged now. Window broken. So the window is about this big. There's a handle in the middle, you know it, so you can open up a window. There was a bottle of dishwasher detergent, they took it out, threw it on the floor. There were three glass bottles, they ditched it out, took it on the floor. Here's the handle, this pill stuff is still hooked up with all kinds of bottles and washing machine uh, detergent. So somebody squeezed in on this amount. I'm not sure how they did it, but they did. Climbed in, set the foot and then their bottom on the uh, cupboard that is below the window, got in, walked through the house, saw a kitchen door that also goes to the garden, realized, hmm, I probably need some kind of a safe mechanism, let's unlock the door already so they could walk out, because I do have keys on the doors. One thing I learned from the previous example is if I'm going to lock up doors, I want to have the key in there just to make sure that I can get away if my neighbor is stupid enough to set his house on fire. Uh, walked into the living room, all the windows were open. Uh, it was on the day that I was not at home, and it was about uh, 9 p.m., we think. So it was dark, and if you are a burglar and you walk into somebody's living room with all the windows open, one thing you don't want to do is make a light. So they went into the hallway, went up to the first floor, lights everywhere, because nobody can look into th that. Search for everything, uh, so I had to put all the stuff back into the cupboard in the bathroom. Um, looked in my computer room, looked around, went up um, to my bedroom, realized that uh, I don't have secret rings or jewelry in my bedroom, but after they opened up all the cupboards, threw all the clothes out, so my top floor live, uh, bedroom was a mess, went back to the first floor, took another look at all the computer equipment I had there, realized the only thing of value I have in my computer room, so not the big quad-core AMD machine, not the two very shiny 24-inch LCD screens with color calibration, not the no pad to write, uh, well, pen, pen pad to uh, do drawings with, not the expensive Logitech keyboards. No, they took my old netbook that I actually had used as part of my alarm system with an atom in there and it, can, it could barely run everything. So that was the one that overcooked got all kinds of interrupt problems after a few days, so I turned it down, opened it up, cleaned it up, put it, screwed it more or less back together, but I was too lazy to put all the keys back, so there were kind of few keys missing and lying next to it, etc. They decided to take that one with them, so everything still is there, uh, that is missing, the only st thing stolen the second time, and they walked out through the, through the kitchen door, and then I came home, I saw, when, when I came home, I saw lights at all the floors, not good. I w went in my, my garden, saw the kitchen door open and lights, not good. I came in and thought, oh shoot. So they took only one thing and horribly enough, that was the part of the alarm system that I still had to replace. Okay, so that's when I bought the Samsung, I fi finally swallowed it, bought the Samsung board and got it working the next week. Uh, wake up. So one of the reasons why I hadn't actually bought that board yet is that I was toying with other ideas that I wanted to do at the same time. So yes, I have more plans, I have a lot more plans and I was working more on those plans than actually getting the system to work. So yeah, stupid me. Stupid me again. So. If I buy that Samsung board, why not go back to ZoneMinder who has their shit together and it actually works? Or buy a Synology disk who actually has all of that in its firmware. Okay, you have to unlock that extra step of firmware to have more than one camera, but it works. It would have worked in April. 
I would have been happy and I would have a picture of the guy who tried to sneak in and get my old broken down five year old netbook. But no, Mr. Van Gen wants more complicated things. So um, if you go to any do-it-yourself do shop, you can find all those kinds of remote things where you can have a light turn on and turn off uh, remotely, etc. Mm -hmm. Less people know that there's also a USB plug for that, so you can do it from a laptop. So I had already buy, bought that, I had already toyed with it, and I had already decided I wanted that to be integrated, which is why the Synology thing wouldn't work, because the Synology thing obviously doesn't know how to, on an alarm, start turning on and off all my lights, so everything starts blinking to get the uh, burglar mad. But I knew I could do it, so that's another reason to keep my software alive, because I can do it. I know I can handle this. And while I'm at it, okay, I also bought at that same Korean, uh, no, Hong Kong company, I bought a USB a thermometer so I can actually measure the temperature of my living room hoping that at some point I can start controlling my uh, central heating system so I can actually save energy and when I tell my central heat heating system hey I'm going home soon can you already start heating my room in the winter I could get home and be warm instead of freezing so I had all kinds of plans and those plans had prevented me from actually making it work Oh, and I had a lot more plans because I want to have a web interface on the remote end so I can actually, somebody think so minder, <laughs> because I want to see at home who is, of when I am at work, I want to see who's actually walking into my room. So plans and plans and plans and in the end I forgot to actually make it work first. Here I am, it works, it's running now, and has been running for the last two weeks. Yay me. And that's why I have recorded mice, I have recorded, <laughs> really, uh, I have recorded all kinds of things, including myself oh, watching, walking into the kitchen, getting myself a cup of tea and going back up again. Because my laptop obviously is now in my bedroom, so I have to go back to my bedroom in order to play my online games. But I learned one heavy lesson. If you're sane, if you're a normal person that is not a geek, you would have bought an alarm system. But no, you have to be stupid if you are techie and you build one yourself. Which means that it will never work, never work in time. You always have more plans than time, so you have always more things to do. So it becomes a project, a never-ending project. And I didn't have those already. People who know me know that I have two games that I care about that I have hardly time to program for. Oh, and I was flying most of the time. Still learning how to fly alone, by the way. So, I learned the hard way. There's a reason why there are companies doing things. Even if I know I can do it, I should buy things instead of trying to do everything by myself. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, anyone? What happens if burglars bring Wi-Fi jammer? Um, if a burglar brings a Wi-Fi jammer into my home, that probably means that the signal gets lost, my router will reset and reboot. That takes about a minute and a half. Um, oh, we stopped recording by the way, did we? <laughs> okay, so, dear burglars, I am currently fixing Wi-Fi jammer issues. I'll detail why I, how I fix it. But, um, so if you bring a Wi-Fi jammer, the signal will go away. Uh, my cameras will happily keep recording because they're not really affected, but the receiving end will decide, oh, I don't have a connection. It will wait for half a minute and then try again. So very likely, if you bring the Wi-Fi jammer before you enter the house, you are, will not be on tape. How do you fix that? 
hey, there's an Ethernet port on it. So if I can get away with putting an Ethernet cable onto my device next to the power cable that is already nicely hidden in the side cracks of the wall, I will have Ethernet, which again also sp makes up room on my uh, uh, Wi-Fi spectrum. So would be a good thing. Unfortunately, Ethernet cables tend to be four times as thick and ugly. And power over Ethernet is a very great invention, but there are no cheap ass cameras that handle it yet. <laughs> yeah, so that means that I have to solder something. Hey, I'm. <laughs> to actually take the power out of the Ethernet cables again, uh, hook that up into the other port, and I have the remaining ports go into the Ethernet and work. Could work. Um, actually, I have all the equipment to do that. Good idea. <laughs> I will do it tomorrow. <laughs> if I staple it to the wall, I probably will not put it on the laptop. But yes, good point. <laughs> uh, you mostly dismissed Zone Miner because of the fact that it didn't, r didn't run efficiently enough on your Raspberry Pi. Yes. Is it otherwise bad software, or because it is presumably open source, you could hack it, you could integrate all, all of your other plans with it? Believe me, I've pondered that quite a bit over the last month, so since the last burglary. Because if I had swallowed my pride, bought a bigger machine, and just installed ZoneMinder on it, I would actually have known what my assailer looked like. So that's what you recommend? insist on making it themselves. Absolutely. And if you don't want to buy a Synology and if you don't have dreams of controlling your home, your whole house by just entering and holding your GSM next to an NFC uh, badge. So ZoneMinder is, well actually ZoneMinder does have a plug-in system so you could hook up all kinds of stuff yourself. Which I might actually still do. Misha. Uh, do you upload your pictures into the cloud because uh, they take away your Okay, Max, how much time have I left? Two minutes. Okay, let's talk about clouds. <laughs> <laughs> Ever heard of PRISM and NSAs? And no, 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 I fully agree with that, but I'm just saying... You, know, you agree with the NSA? No, I, I agree with it. maybe not a good idea. But yeah, so I currently have still, still have a subscription with UPC, which means that I have a lot of download space and a very tiny upload link. Yeah. So actually getting everything to the cloud is, I don't even think theoretically a possibility through that very small upload link. Um, of course, good luck for a burglar to actually recognize my small little box if it's somewhere stored in a room, in the living room in a corner. Yes, there is a blue LED blinking, blue LED blinking, good for geeks. Uh, but <laughs> so, so you store everything on the EMC? Uh on the Today, yes. Tomorrow, no. And I'm not going to tell you where. Very good. Because there's still somebody listening. <laughs> Have you tried uh, uh, looking at the images from the camera at night that you can actually recognize someone? Because the uh, uh, technical university here, they, uh, they have uh, had uh, several incidents recently where a burglar was actually recorded by the camera, but the image quality was too, too poor to recognize it. So, I only took one famous face I know very well and had it walk through the room at night, actually wave into the camera and walk on, which is my own face. So, I am a bit familiar with the face, but not from looking in the mirror. And I did recognize myself, so that's why I think it is more or less fine. However, the infrared does tend to overshine on light surfaces like this. So I hope my burglar will be uh, having a more dark skin complexion because it works better. Zero minutes left. So, sorry guys, um, <laughs> that's the end of it. Please don't burglar my house. <laughs> Thank you.